Well, good afternoon. I'm delighted to welcome you to Bill Cronin's retirement address. We've waited a long, long time, many years, <laughs> for this address. My name is Susan Zesky, and I'm Associate Dean for Arts and Humanities in the College of Letters and Science, and I'm just uh, pleased and delighted to serve as your host uh, this afternoon and, and also um, for the retirement dinner this evening for those of you who will be staying uh, for that. Now, many of you in the room um, have been here all day um, contemplating keynotes uh, keywords uh, that have uh, guided Bill's thinking. And then many more of you are uh, just joining us. Uh, and some of you are joining us in person and others are joining us uh, online because this is being live streamed and recorded. Before I introduce Bill Cronin, and he does need introduction, <laughs> I want to thank Susan Lee Johnson and Carl Jacoby for the tremendous Keywords Conference that they put together this afternoon. Thank you. And for organizing today's events and tonight's events as well, I want to thank Professor Juliana Chamides from uh, the History Department, as well as Leah Harmon from this, the History Department, Professor Matt Turner from Geography, and Emily Reynolds from the Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies. Thank you for all of your work. And I want to invite everyone to stay immediately after Bill's remarks for a reception. And it'll be held right outside that door um, where most of us entered and uh, right by the information desk. So we can uh, continue conversations, uh, reconnect with, with old friends, and uh, have some libations as well. Uh, th for those of you who are staying for the dinner, uh, we will be seated promptly at 6.15 p.m. Um, to leave plenty of time for toasting and roasting. <laughs> in this gathering of so many people who have devoted their professional and personal lives to studying, teaching, and writing about the lands and peoples of North America, I want to begin with an acknowledgement of the First Nations and Indigenous peoples who have lived in this place long before this university, this city, this state, this nation existed. UW-Madison sits on lands that are ancestral to the Ho-Junk Nation, and Wisconsin itself is home to 11 other First Nations whose sovereignty we respect and whose ongoing presence here we honor. Although we now make our homes on this continent, we've been reminded during this conference today and by the work of many of you in this room of the importance of coming to terms with the conflicts and struggles and oppressions that mark the histories of the homes in which we all now live. Striving to understand our different perspectives on these difficult histories is essential to the work of building a more just society. Our gathering here today should be an occasion for committing ourselves anew. Many here today are familiar with the legend of Bill Cronin as a wunderkind, <laughs> though it is unknown to some. So I'm going to repeat it. It'll be re repetition for those of you who, who know it. It might be new for some. But I'm going to add a few chapters who, that are probably less known to his colleagues, in their, who he's known as a research colleague and, and a teaching colleague, uh, but more familiar to those of us who worked with him to help transform the university uh, and particularly the undergraduate experience here at UW-Madison. Well, as the Wunderkind legend goes, after earning his bachelor's degree in history and English in UW-Madison in 1976, Bill left home on the wings of a Rhodes Scholarship to Oxford University, where in just two years he earned his first doctorate. He then headed to New Haven, Connecticut in 1978, and within the next five years he had earned two master's degrees from Yale University, published a field-defining book, and was an awarded a tenure-track professorship at Yale even though he had not yet completed his American PhD. His first book, Changes in the Land, Indians, Colonists, and the Ecology of New England, began as a seminar paper during his initial year of graduate study at Yale. 
According to the legend of Bill, he wrote the paper in only three days, though he had done four months of research on it, and he pulled an all-nighter, yanking the final page out of the typewriter at 4 a.m. just to get it in on time. After only a few more months of work, Cronin had a full book manuscript. The resulting monograph won the 1984 Society of American Historians Francis Parkman Prize and has endured as an early classic of environmental history. Two years later, Cronin was awarded a MacArthur Genius Award. In 1990, as a Yale doctoral candidate, well, at the same time as a tenured as an associate professor of history, doctoral candidate and associate professor, Cronin filed a book manuscript to satisfy the dissertation requirement. It was published without revision by W.W. W. Norton, and the next year it was his second book, Nature's Metropolis, Chicago and the Great West. It won the Bancroft Prize, and it was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. Nature's metropolis shaped the field of environmental history and has inspired generations of scholars. This book, I remind you, was his unrevised dissertation, and it earned him the rank of full professor at Yale University. A major turning point in the legend of Bill Cronin occurred in 1992. <laughs> When, after having served on the history faculty at Yale University, he returned to his undergraduate alma mater, UW-Madison, as the Frederick Jackson Turner Professor of History, Geography, and Environmental Studies, all the three being very important uh, that they were all together in, in the title of his professorship. Even though Cronin was highly successful at that ivy-clad institution in New Haven, as Stanford historian and fellow MacArthur and Guggenheim recipient Richard White observed in his eloquent 2012 biographical essay of William Cronin, quote, Yale, in a sense, could never engage Cronin as much as the University of Wisconsin and Madison. It lacked the same tradition of community service. And as anyone who has taught at both well-endowed private universities and public universities, particularly land-grant universities, knows it is the public universities, not the private, that are the backbone of a democratic society. Yeah. <laughs> Cronin's commitment to public engagement, to community service, to democracy, pulled him back to UW-Madison to do environmental history. For Madison was where his mother, Jean Cronin, had taught him to explore and appreciate the natural world around him. And it was in Madison that his father, David Cronin, professor of history and chair of the history department and dean of the College of Letters and Science, instilled in young Bill a love for American history. And it was in Madison where he had first learned of Wisconsin's tremendous environmental tradition and its major thinkers, Frederick Jackson Turner, Aldo Leopold, John Muir, Frank Lloyd Wright. And it was in Madison where as a young man, he was exposed to the Wisconsin idea, the connection between the university's intellectual life with the public life of the state. Cronin's commitment to the public good is strongly evident as early as in the dress that he delivered in 1976 when he was gradu graduating senior, and it was at the Honors Convocation, and that was 46 years ago, almost to, within uh, the next two weeks. In it, he planted the seeds of themes he would develop fully throughout his career. In that address, Cronin warned classmates about the impending disaster that would result due to shortages in energy and food unless people made drastic changes. He implored fellow students to employ their talents and learning to find solutions to the problem. That will only happen, said graduating senior Bill Cronin, when we look into each other's eyes and realize the magnitude of our interconnectedness. Cronin's articulation of the magnitude of human interconnectedness in the address he delivered at age 21 would develop into a philosophy that would inform his scholarship, teaching, and service, and eventually would transform the undergraduate experience at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. 
Cronin offered a full-throated statement of this philosophy in a sermon delivered at Madison's first Unitarian Society, and then, more famously, in his essay, Only Connect, The Goals of a Liberal Education, published in The American Scholar in 1998 and republished hundreds and thousands of times and still read by many, many, many undergraduates, especially first-year students all around the country and, and around the world. Only Connect eloquently explores the meaning, values, and importance of a liberal education. Cronin concludes the essay by stating, liberal education nurtures human freedom in the service of human community, which is to say, in the end, it celebrates love. The philosophy of Only Connect and the vision laid out in his 1999 essay, A Great Undergraduate University, guided Cronin's Herculean efforts over the next 20 years to transform the undergraduate experience at UW-Madison. With the support of a number of key alumni, staff, and faculty, Cronin set UW on a pathway to excellence. Working collaboratively, he made the honors program, he remade the honors program to be accessible to all undergraduate students, empowering them to engage with the life of the mind in the service of making the world a better place. Cronin founded and served as the first faculty director of Chadbourne Residential College, which catalyzed the development of residential learning communities on this campus. He began the Writing Fellows Program, in which talented undergraduates work with their peers to improve writing. He created the Undergraduate Research Scholars Program, connecting students with faculty to gain hands-on experience in research and creative expression. And he led the process that renamed, mapped, and produced the first ever master plan for the UW-Madison's Lakeshore Nature Preserve, a half square mile of land that includes Bill's beloved Picnic Point. Somehow, he was also able to help found in 2006 the Center for Culture, History, and Environment, CHE, and to serve as its director for eight years total. Bill did all of this programming, program building and more while advising dozens of graduate students, offering huge undergraduate courses to not only undergrads but senior auditors, and serving his department, university, and profession generously. Plus, he was weighed down with countless accolades such as being named Fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the British Academy, and he served as the President of the American Historical Association, giving the only presidential address to that organization ever devoted solely to undergraduate teaching. Bill, we thank you for returning to Madison in 1992 to nurture the common good here on our campus, in our community. And we welcome you now, and we're so glad you're back in Madison to deliver your retirement address entitled, Looking Back on a Long Journey, People, Places, and Stories. I give you Bill Cronin. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's going to be hard. I'm doing something that I rarely do, which is I don't have a note in front of me. I don't have an outline. I don't have a script. Uh, I have been thinking for weeks and weeks and weeks about what I might want to say, but because there's been an amazing conference all day today, I didn't want to think ahead of time about what I would want to say tonight. So I'm going to do this by trying to just speak from the heart. And I'm going to begin by a ritual that happened at every session in the conference today, which is to thank Susan Johnson and Carl Jacoby, who were the ones who organized that conference. It was a conference uh, which was a kind of homage to the classic book by Raymond Williams called Keywords, which takes several dozen, 70 or so words that Williams, the British literary critic, regarded as foundational to Anglo-American and European thought over the last half millennium or thereabouts, and that are the tools for our cultural, political, civic life, and write their histories using the Oxford English Dictionary in particular as a resource. And what Susan and Carl did was to ask a bunch of my former PhD students to each write an essay on a keyword that was 
somehow relevant to stuff that I and they care about. And over the course of the past many hours, we have been treated to, I wish you all could have been there, an astonishing series of wonderful presentations, amazing panel discussions that happily will all be going into a book together, which you should all read because it was an amazing work. And Susan and Carl, it was a brilliant idea to do that. Keywords and Williams are one of my foundational texts, even though I've rarely cited them in anything I've written. I have certain key figures that shaped who I am, who actually almost never got cited in my work. Williams is one of them. William James, interestingly, is another. Uh, Lauren Isley is a third. There's a series of people who made big impacts on me. But one of the beauties of the choice of keywords, as Susan, I think, especially knows, is because um, I'm interested in a lot of stuff. Uh, and <laughs> m my students are interested in a lot of stuff. To assume that my students say all do environmental history would be to do violence to their eclecticism and to the kind of intellectual range that that community of people has. And so the beauty of the keywords idea, and Susan Carr were well aware that this was up to, was that it was a very, very capacious container for a set of wide ranging categories that led to some really beautiful conversations today. And I will say, uh, we all began by thanking people. I want to begin with thanks for that, that gift that you guys did and all the years of work that went into putting it together. And I want to thank you and everyone who presented, everyone who's written essays for the project, and all of you are here. Um, it's good, there are going to be moments in this that are going to hard, be hard for me to do without crying. Um, you know, it's, this is a very weird moment in my life. Uh, I'm somebody who, uh, up until a very few years ago, kind of didn't imagine I would ever retire. And certainly I would never retire before 70 or 75, because I love, I really love what I do. And it was a weird concatenation of events, falling in love with Jennifer Duick, who's a Canadian citizen who teaches at the University of Mont uh, Manitoba, and wanting to, wanting to live with her was a pretty good incentive not to continue living in Madison. Um, realizing that I had, stupidly or not, had accumulated like 17 years without taking a sabbatical, which seemed kind of dumb. So I, it, it, produced, it produced a weird concatenation where I took a sabbatical and then realized I had to do another semester of teaching following that sabbatical under the terms of sabbaticals at the University of Wisconsin. But by then we were in COVID. And so my last semester of teaching was done from a desk in Manitoba, in Winnipeg, virtually, with three extraordinary TAs to whom I will be forever grateful, where we formed a virtual community, not people I had worked with before, and had actually one of the most amazing teaching experiences of my life, but it was all virtual. And if you know the way I teach, one of the things I believe about teaching is that there are at least three radically different venues in which those of us who care about teaching practice our craft. There is the one-on-one -on -one personal mentoring relationship, which has a kind of intimacy of intellectual companionship, which is almost as close to parenting as anything I know. And I really think of my, my PhD students and the people who are in this room as, you know, second only to my own children, as people that I have just a profound connection to and caring about. And so thank you so much. My life is so blessed, so blessed for the people who are in this room and who are here as part of this community we share, we share together. So mentoring one-on-one -on -one is a venue. The seminar, uh, the discussion section of say 12, 20 people talking about stuff you care about is a completely different craft skill, a completely different set of ways of gathering people together to help them talk about stuff, meet each other, care about each other, respect each other, not violate each other, be willing to hear each other say things that upset each other and yet tolerate the upset so that you learn across the differences. That's a very hard space. I actually think it's the hardest kind of teaching and it's a little odd that it's the first kind of teaching we often give graduate students because it is hard. It is hard leading discussion sections. And then the third is the lecture, which is the most theatrical of the spaces within which we teach. 
And usually it's scripted, and if you know me, I do it with pictures and Sonny Lumiere, and there's lots of visual stuff going on. But we're in this unusual space today where I'm just gonna kind of make it up as I go along in this space. And here I'll say that there is a man in the room I have to acknowledge who's sitting in the middle right here in blue, who I've done an homage to uh, in my American Historical Association presidential address. If you've not listened to, watched, or read that address, I would urge you to do it. It's one of the very few AHA presidential addresses that has a one-word title, no subtitle, very unusual academic cut of It's called Storytelling. And the last third of it is an homage to my most important undergraduate mentor, Richard Ringler, Dick Ringler, who is right here, who almost, almost persuaded me to be a scholar of Anglo-Saxon England, the Germanic North, the Vikings, Iceland, <laughs> uh, teaching me Old English, teaching me Beowulf, teaching me Old Norse. For two and a half years, in fact, when I won the Rhodes Scholarship, I was supposed to go to England to study Old English and do medieval studies. And then in my senior year of college, by accident, not quite by accident, I'll, I have a turn to make in a second, um, I took a course on the history of the American West, taught by my predecessor in the Frederick Jackson Turner chair, Alan G. Bogue, one of the great Western historians of his generation, and particularly a historian of the public lands and of people's relationship to land, who taught that Western history course with a very strong interest in controversy over the public lands and the history of conservation. And I suddenly realized that the kaleidoscopic way of teaching a place and a people and a time that Dick Ringler had taught me about England from 5th century to 12th century of the Common Era could actually be applied to my own country, my own land, the United States and North America and Canada too. I have to say I have a lifelong love affair of Canada and it's interesting and surprising, but maybe not so surprising that I now find myself living in Canada, but that I could teach the way Dick Ringler had taught me to teach because it was really Dick more than anyone else who showed me what really brilliant undergraduate, the theater of undergraduate teaching could be um, that led me to do, to make that move and shift into Western history and environmental history. One of the things I decided I would do, and I'm mindful here that I'm doing, I'm about to do what uh, close to what Phil Deloria earlier today warned people not to do, which is, he said, historians of a certain age feel compelled to embark on long tomes of autobiographical reflections in which they offer great thoughts about how history ought to be practiced. Um, and he warned me of even the Library of Congress call letters in which these books appear, largely unread and highly irrelevant to the current generation who has no interest in what that older generation might have to say. I mean, this is my retirement and... Um, <laughs> And so what I wanted to do here is not offer great thoughts, um, not that at all. And here I'm gonna say thanks again to Susan and Carl. Uh, when I reached the end of that last round of history, geography, environmental studies, 460 American environmental history in December of 2020, I retired on December 31st, 2020, right in the middle of COVID. And I, the Canadian US border has been very hard to cross for the last two years, uh, mainly because of quarantine rules on the Canadian side, which basically require you to, for, for a year and a half, if you crossed the border and came back, you had to live inside your house. The government would call you every two days and tell you that you couldn't even walk your dog outside of the house. You were really held to your own property. And since Jen and I are, are co-parenting a 10-year-old child, that was complicated because no one moves back and forth between two households. So the quarantine was tough, and one of the reasons I didn't come. But as a result, I retired and nothing happened. <laughs> Meaning I, I wasn't in Madison. All the dear friends who are in this room who live in Madison or who are far flung across the country, it was like I retired and nobody noticed. <laughs> um, and, you know, uh, Leonardo talked and I talked about a retirement celebration, which we initially imagined might happen in April of 21. 
but of course the pandemic was in no condition. We talked about doing it virtually. I hated the idea of doing it virtually because, I mean, look at all of you. It, it's being in the room together as embodied beings, sharing our lives together, sharing community. That is finally what it's about. We've A lot of us have learned how to sustain community with Zoom and thank God for Zoom in the time that we've had. And yet it's not still the same. So we canceled that retirement event in the spring of 21. And here we are a year later, which means it's been three years, not only since I've been in Madison with anybody I care about or know, this is the astonishing part. It's been three years. I lived my life, the theatrical lecturing part of my life, behind these things, with stuff happening on that screen, stuff I love, stuff I care enormously about, and where the excitement for we, me is taking my own excitement and pouring it out into the room and seeing the people out there going, oh, that's so cool. And that has been a source of joy for me in my life. And this is the first time I've been at a podium in more than three years. I've not gone that long without lecturing, and not kidding, since what was then called junior high school. So it's been a, it's been a very long time. I don't want to offer great thoughts from my illustrious career. That is not here what I'm about at all. And I want to actually quickly add a footnote to what Suzeski said. She talked about a lot of cool projects I was involved in, Chadbourne Residential Kellers, the Writing Fellows Program. Brad Hughes is in this room. He's the real genius and author who created the Writing Fellows Program. Nothing I've done have I ever done by myself, ever. And for me to take credit by myself does violence to all the people that I've done what I do with. And it's the doing with that's what matters. It's not, hey, look at me, look at the cool stuff I did. That's not what life is about. Life is about doing stuff together. And one of the joys of my life and my career has been the doing together. And I've done lots of stuff in lots of different venues so that this is actually the very first time in my life, and I'm sure the last, that people from so many parts of my life are in one room together. And you know, many of you don't have much connection to each other, and yet, one way or another, we've all done really cool things together in this room. And in the reception that follows, I'd urge you just to meet some random people and ask what cool things you have to talk about and share in this space. Um, I gave an homage to Dick Ringler in my HA presidential address. The homage I wanna do today is to my parents, uh, and especially to my father, who was formerly the Dean of the College of Letters and Science, Eric's predecessor in that job, and Carl's predecessor in that space. Um, because interestingly enough, it was my father, and if you would have to know my father and know Dick Ringler to know why this is surprising. It was my father in my second semester of my first year at Wisconsin, who said, you know, you might want to take a course with Dick Ringler. Two more different people than my father and Dick Ringler. It is really pretty hard to imagine. <laughs> that They are both amazing human beings, but they are very different human beings. And I still don't quite know what it was in my father that recognized that Dick Ringler would somehow speak to me, except for one thing. And now I go to Flannery Burke and her presentation today alluded to the wind in the willows and especially the hobbit and bilbo baggins um and uh <laughs> um i don't want to make universal claims about history one of the things we've learned over the last generation of scholarship not just in history but in the academy generally is that the universal claims to knowledge that were attributed to the Enlightenment and that characterized the Cold War era in which I, a baby boomer, grew up are not where we are today. All knowledge is situated. All of us are situated. All of us come to our, identity, to our identities by very, very different paths and routes. And, you know, I'm a very privileged white male 
largely cisgendered, though I've come to understand my queerness more in recent years than I ever had before, because I'm a man who's never been comfortable with masculinity, and many of my dearest friends are women, and I think that's not an accident that the world is constructed, that my world is constructed that way. But I'm an academic brat, which means, which is to say, I'm the child of a university professor, and I've lived in research universities all my life. I was born in New Haven, Connecticut. My father then did a year of research at the Library of Congress in DC. We then moved to Lincoln, Nebraska, where we were for three years on the Great Plains, south of the Canadian prairies that I am now at, and then moved to Wisconsin, where I started third grade, and I grew up in Wisconsin, where, importantly, both of my parents' families go back to the middle of the 19th century. My name is Cronin, which is Irish, which comes through my father, but my father was at least half German, so my four grandparents are Cronin, Irish, Hotmar, Meyer, Fox. So I'm an interesting example of a classic, classic German-Irish hybrid, very typical of the upper Midwest, though I grew up thinking I was a wasp. I mean, I had no sense of my Germanness, although I had a sense of my Irishness and the kind of rebelliousness of the Irish against wasps was part of my heritage, even though the German part, the suppressed German part, hardly fits that picture at all. That's important to who I became and who I was. Um, huh. So I wanna, I wanna share some stuff about my parents that there are a number of people in this room who I think will understand me better by what I'm about to share. And you'll understand why I care about what I care about and also what are the anxieties that have driven me and the feelings of fear of failure and also intense fears of hurting other people and of wanting to care for other people that came out of the childhood, the very odd childhood that I had. I don't think I'm self-praising to tell you I was a difficult child in the sense that my parents knew that I was pretty smart from an early age, and they struggled to figure out what to do with a kid who was as smart and articulate as I was. They talked, their, the school wanted to skip me ahead grades. They were adamant that they would not let that happen because they didn't want me to get out of sync with my age cohort, which I think was a very wise decision on their part. But they also fed my sort of insatiable curiosity. My mom in particular uh, came up with endless hobbies for me um, that included collecting fossils, collecting stones, collecting butterflies, pressing plants, all the natural history stuff that would go into my eventual passion for field ecology and field biology and geology, the, the kind of natural sciences that have remained passions of mine all this time. My dad, when he'd been a kid, uh, had edited a little uh, neighborhood newspaper that he called The Echo, which he uh, printed on a hectograph. I don't know how many people in this room remember what a hectograph was, but it was a gelatin plate that you put on a pan and you would write it with a special did the purple ditto pencils that some of you may remember. I apologize, you're hearing boomer talk now. <laughs> And I've come, I'm married to a millennial, uh, and I've, I, I, I've, 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 I pay enough attention to my students to know that the last thing that half the people in this room want to hear any more about is the childhood of the boomers. Uh, and there are many people are ready for the boomers just to get off the stage and clear the way for other people to be here. And yet, one of the things I took from this afternoon's presentations, and one of the things I believe about history, is that all of us, every one of us, especially those of us who teach and who do history, we are all bridges between generations. We all are bridges between our parents and our grandparents and our children and grandchildren. And that act of bridging, of passing on, even as we battle with our parents and grandparents and our children, all those generational frictions, there's still an act of passing on that happens. And it's that act of passing on that I want to talk a little bit here. My dad edited a, uh, edited a neighborhood newspaper, so I had to edit a neighborhood newspaper, which was called The Echo 2. 
And that gave way to another neighborhood newspaper called the Varsity Variety, because we lived on a street called Varsity Hill. So I would mimeograph it and deliver it to all the, all the neighborhood houses in fifth grade. Then come high school uh, at a time which was the sort of early years of the Vietnam War, and I will linger on this one for a while. Um, we had an official student newspaper at James Madison Memorial High School called The Sword and Shield. We had a radical underground anti-war newspaper uh, edited by several students in the school called Behind the Shield. And it probably will not surprise many people in this room to know that I kind of wasn't comfortable in either of those two spaces because what really interested me was are there ways that people who really disagree with each other or who don't understand each other can actually share enough to even though they're not going to agree with each other at least they can try to understand each other and if they try to understand each other maybe their disagreements won't be so violent maybe they might actually be productive Maybe they might actually compromise. Maybe they can figure out a way to move forward. So I started editing a not so underground newspaper, uh, though it wasn't an official school newspaper, called Con, capital C, capital O, capital N, Glomerate, Conglomerate, which I brought out every single week for three years at Memorial High School. And its core commitment was to dialogue, which is to say, I recruited people of different points of view to talk about their different points of view and share with each other why they thought the way that they did and then talk about how things might, what they might learn from each other from doing that. And there is a way in which I have been doing that my entire life. That underground newspaper conglomerate is what I've been doing ever since. And there's more to the story still than that. So, <laughs> On the one hand, I have followed in my father's footsteps more than anyone has a right to do. Um, I, I was born in New Haven, Connecticut. My father's first teaching job was at Yale University. My first teaching job was at Yale University. My father left Yale and eventually ended up at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I came back to the University of Wisconsin-Madison from Yale as well. Even though I entered college, I had so many potential majors when I entered Wisconsin as an undergraduate, I knew I was going to be an English major because I actually knew from about third grade on that I wanted to be a writer. It's my oldest passion. It's my oldest desire was to be a writer. And again, I think I got that from my father because he too was quite a gifted and skilled writer. His master's thesis became a biography of, Black Moses, of Marcus Garvey called Black Moses a very, very early work of African-American history that was for decades the best-selling book of the University of Wisconsin Press, pioneering work of African-American history. And you need to know about my dad that he was, I think, a quintessential Cold War liberal in all the meanings of that word. He was born in 1924. He served in the Philippines as a second lieutenant during the Second World War and was there in the staging for what would have been the invasion of Japan in the closing moments of that war. And he never gave up on the conviction that his life, and therefore my life, had been saved by the dropping of the atomic bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, that the dropping of those two bombs, which I regarded as an abomination, a horrifying act that I regretted and thought should never have happened, my father never doubted that he was alive because of those two bombs and because I wouldn't have been born if he'd been dead, I wouldn't have existed without those bombs being dropped in that way. And I name that because, you know, my father was very clearly a supporter of the civil rights movement uh, and very actively supportive of it in the 1950s and 60s. But he's also a child of the 1930s and of the war against fascism. And he was the chair of the University of Wisconsin History Department at the height of the anti-war protests. And he was the chair of the History Department, which was then located in Bascom Hall during the initial Dow Chemical protests, which became the famous Dow Chemical riot in the parking lot behind Bascom Hall. And was, my dad was one of the only people in the building when he found a wastebasket in one of the classrooms that had been set on fire 
with the purpose he presumed of burning down the building. And I think the further my father watched that war and the protests on this campus against this war, I'm not sure it was that he moved to the right, but I think the world moved to his left. I think he, in his own mind, he stood still, but he was, I think, pretty clear that the radical students who were protesting the war were for him a, um, a, an incarnation of what he had saw, seen happening in Nazi Germany in the 1930s. And that the book, bam, the book burnings, the various acts of violence, protests that looked like they were becoming violence, the burning down, the destruction, and particularly the destruction of the university that he loved. And of course, the Sterling Hall bombing would be the both the climax of those protests and oddly also the end of those protests. It's an oddity of the Sterling Hall bombing that in many ways the anti-war movement on this campus didn't quite collapse, but boy did it radically alter in the wake of that bombing. Why do I share this about my father? Well, I'm a bridge between generations. And I will tell you, so my father was a high school debater. He encouraged me to be a high school debater. One of the reasons I can do what I'm doing right now is that for three or four years, I was on the Memorial High School debate team, although I initially did the affirmative position, which is where you're given a resolution and you build a very elaborate argument defending that proposition. When you're on the negative, you have to take whatever the affirmative throws at you and reply, I love the negative. And the reason that I love the negative in debate was that no matter what argument, you didn't know what it was gonna be, you had to think on your feet and come up with the counter argument that was going to do that. And it was my dad who encouraged me to do that. Vietnam was our debate. So all through my late high school years and early college years, I lived at home my first year of college, one of the biggest mistakes I've ever made. I, <laughs> if, I, if I could take anything back, it would be that. But it, it was a mistake. But I would say for three years, uh, our family dinner table uh, every night was open warfare between my father and me over Vietnam and over, uh, over what I regarded as his betrayal of his own values. And fathers and sons being, knowing each other, knowing each other's buttons, knowing how they can bait each other, knowing how they can debate cruelly, not debate toward respect or truth or understanding, but toward scoring points and winning. Um, which is the worst kind of debate. It's what I hate about our current politics. The debate toward polemic, as opposed to debate toward understanding. But that's what my dad and I did to each other. Um, and I learned a ton. I mean, my dad was a very skilled debater. He made very smart arguments in favor of the war in Vietnam, as I was making skilled arguments against the war in Vietnam. And we honed each other's skills and we came very close to killing each other's love for each other. Um, it was brutal on my brother who hated, my brother was never, I was, I think, I still think I was a hard, I was a hard person to have as an older brother, but it, neither my brother nor my mother wanted the violence of that dinner table, the verbal violence of that dinner table. And so it was just super painful. And so when I left home and went to live on campus, it sort of brought those fights to an end. And um, there's a way in which I spent the next decade pondering what I didn't like about what I'd learned from that violence of what we did, what he and I did to each other. A man who I cared about as much as any human being I've ever known. So among the things my dad gave me are things my grad students here will recognize. Several people today alluded to my um, brutal markup of their drafts, and there were some maybe of quotations of things I'd written on people's drafts. Um, when I was in fourth grade, and this tells you, I guess, <laughs> the respect my father had for me, he edited the cabinet diaries of Josephus Daniels, who was Secretary of the Navy under, under Franklin Roosevelt, a former Tar Heel editor in North Carolina who was involved in the New Deal, kept very elaborate diaries uh, in the cabinet meetings. And my dad had a photocopy of all of Daniel's diaries, which he 
painfully transcribed, and then they were typeset. And the galleys, which in those days were long sheets of paper, which hadn't yet been cut into pages because it wasn't computer typeset, it was metal type, typography that was being set. You had to read those galleys, and because it wasn't just reading your own manuscript, you were actually transcribing a document, it had to be exactly accurate. It had to be exactly what Daniels had written. So my dad used me when I was in fourth grade <laughs> as his proofreader where he would read from the original and I would follow in the galleys and we would read, the day came, comma, that this happened, semicolon, space, space. We read not just every word, but every misspelling, every punctuation mark, and did it precisely. And I learned something about rigor from that. I learned something about archives. I learned something about the difficulty of reading documents carefully and precisely that never left me. And as I began to write stuff, my father was my most <laughs> um, consistent and brutal copy editor. So although I was a pretty good writer for a fifth grader or a sixth grader or a seventh grader, <laughs> I would give him these rough drafts and they would come up blue penciled or red penciled so you could barely see the original text. And although that was hard, it's hard on the ego because you know, I'm pretty good, but no, I wasn't nearly as good as I thought I was. And that was actually both, and it's another lesson that Phil Deloria pointed to, it was a, a reminder of the need for humility and it was also a reminder that the only way you learn <laughs> is to let yourself be open to criticism, to be vulnerable to criticism in that kind of way. And that in truth, one of the greatest gifts my ever, father ever gave me was that copy editing. I would not now write the way I do had he not been so rigorous in what he gave me. And many people in this room, whether they liked it or not, <laughs> were the legatees of my passing on that gift from my father in that space. Two last things about my dad and my parents. Um, my dad was, you know, he, I think he knew he was gonna be a university professor probably by the end of college, certainly by the time he came back from the end of the war. Um, and he got his PhD from here, here at Wisconsin and eventually got to come back to Wisconsin. My mom was a, a sort of lower middle class kid from a tiny town in central Wisconsin, about 65 miles north of here called Princeton, where her parents, John and Lillian Hotmar, the Nelsons are here and know, and know Princeton, Wisconsin well, uh, in the mid twenties had bought what became the Ace Hardware in that town. And my mom was born in a little wood frame house behind the hardware. And she was the hardware store owner's kid. Um, her mom was the businessman of that family, and I use the gendered language advisedly. Lillian wore the pants in that family. John was a carpenter and a plumber, beloved by everybody, had an eighth grade education. Lillian had gone to college. Um, and my mom never had a sense of herself as an intellectual, never had a sense. She always felt intimidated by the university faculty, um, although she had a bachelor's in nursing and in fact got a master's in nursing and taught nursing at the Yale nursing school for several years. So she had plenty of chops, but she had none of the confidence and everything about the gendered politics of the academy fed that her own uncertainty, her own self-doubt in a way that always made her feel, um, I don't want to say inferior to my father because my parents had a very interesting marriage where she owned the social space and he owned the professional employment space and they leaned on each other in that space in ways for that generation that I think actually worked quite well for both of them in that space. But my mom was not, she was intimidated by the academy um, and very, very concerned that I not think I was better than anyone else because I was smart. So over and over again, I got a strange double-edged message from my parents, but especially from her, which left me full of guilt to this day. Uh, it drives me to this day. And it was a paradoxical emotion. I was aware that my parents were really proud of me 
You know, every time I got good grades, every time I came back with an award, every time I won a debate team thing, every time I got something like a Rhodes Scholarship, they were unbelievably excited. And then immediately after, there was the message, especially from my mother, don't think you're any better than anybody else. Don't let this go to your head. You're no better than anybody else. And she's right. She's right. But it is a hard double message that the very thing that you're being told you're good for and that you kind of feel, well, I am kind of good at this, is also something don't feel proud of yourself for that. It's not good to think you're better than everybody else. And I live in that space. My anxieties are awash in that space. But I'm grateful for that. That was, it's a painful gift. It's cost me a lot of um, tough stuff in my life. And yet, lastly, I'm, I grew up in a world where most of my life was in Madison, Wisconsin, with a lot of other academic brats, a lot of really smart kids, all my best friends in high school. The things they've gone on to do are astonishing. Um, they were super smart kids. And that was another way I knew I wasn't any better than anybody else, because some of them were clearly smarter than I was. So I learned that there are a lot of different ways of knowing in this world, and we can't be all good at all of them. So one more thing I want to offer here relevant to today's conversation is that, this will sound super arrogant, but at some point in my undergraduate years, I wrote a note in my journal that said, the, the arrogance of the first clause, please forgive me, a person can do anything, he cannot do everything. A person can do anything, cannot do everything. And that weirdly was a revelation for me because up until that point in my life, I thought I could do not just anything, but everything. I could study anything I wanted, know anything I wanted to know, and I found it all interesting, so why not? Um, but then I really realized that unless I committed myself to something, if I did one thing well and really put, poured my energy into that, then I might really do something that might make a difference in the world. Because I was an academic brat and loved everything, uh, the discovery of history, the history of the West, and especially environmental history, is a space where everything was relevant. Geology, biology, ecology, economics, sociology, politics, history, physics, comp sci, you name it. They could all be brought under the glorious umbrella of trying to do a better job of understanding the past. That was so cool. And it meant that one of my passions, because one of my frustrations with the academy is that so many academics live in their mind shafts and don't talk with their colleagues in the next building over who don't share their disciplinary perspectives. So over and over again, I tried to bring people together across disciplinary boundaries and to train graduate students who would ignore disciplinary boundaries and do whatever the question asked them to do. Not worry about what's the box you're inside of, but you're looking at something in the world. The world isn't inside of a box. The academy's boxes are just different ways of looking at the world. So learn how those ways of looking at the world work and use the ones that are helpful. And at least for the moment, set the others aside until they become useful, but understand it enough so that you can do that. And then also recognize that there are different people who've committed themselves to different disciplines and you need those other people. Because I can't learn economics the way Carl Schultz knows economics. I can't know chemistry the way Kathy Middlecamp knows chemistry. I can't know engineering the way John Nelson knows engineering. If I wanna know how those disciplines teach those amazing people and everyone else in this room, I don't know how commercial fishing works, the way Marsha Home in this room knows commercial fishing. I'm never gonna learn anything. So opening spaces where that became possible was important. I'm almost at time. So one of the things Flannery did in her talk, as I said at the beginning, was to invoke the Hobbit and the Wind in the Willows. It was the Hobbit that brought uh, my dad to point me at Dick Ringler, because I was, I was a Tolkien kid, 
of the first order, and Tolkien was an Anglo-Saxonist at Oxford. I was also a Narnian. Um, I was a Madeleine Langellian in Wrinkle of Time. I loved, loved an author who probably isn't nearly as well known to many people in this room, Alan Garner, an uh, extraordinary English writer who wrote The Weird Stone of Brisingamen and The Moon of Gomrath, which I would recommend to anybody in this room. But, you know, of, of the books that have made the biggest difference to me in my life, and I never picked just one, probably half of them are kids' books or young adult fiction of one kind or another. And the one that I encountered in fourth grade that changed my life forever was Norton Juster's Phantom Tollbooth, which I read just about when it came out, because I would have been uh, just, I was born in 54, that book came in, out in 61, so I probably came, read it a year or two after it came out. I don't know, how, ma how many of you have read The Phantom Tollbooth? So maybe half of you, it's not as well known now as it once was. The premise of it is that there's this very bored little boy named Milo who finds school completely boring, but everything else is completely boring. Nothing in the world is interesting at all. Uh, he comes home one day and finds a big blue box in his room, which when he unpacks it, turns out to be a toll booth. And so he gets in his little electric car, thinks it looks pretty boring, but he doesn't have anything better to do. So he gets in the car, drives to the gate of the toll booth, puts the money in, it opens, and suddenly, he finds himself in a completely different land called the land, of, uh, the land of Knowledge. And the Land of Knowledge has two kingdoms um, ruled over by two brothers, the King Azaz, who is the king of letters and words, and the Mathemagician, who is the, kingdom of, the king of Digitopolis, the Land of Numbers. And the Land of Letters, of Words, and the Land of Numbers are at war with each other because what was originally the land of wisdom had been ruptured when the old king of wisdom had died and his two brothers inherited the throne. And they banished their sisters, the princesses of rhyme and reason, to the <laughs> castle in the air above the mountains of ignorance that had left the land of wisdom without a way of reconciling all the different points of view across all the different mine shafts and post holes that the land of knowledge is disciplinarily divided into. So what happens to Milo is that the king, of, the king, first the king Azaz, sends him on the mission to rescue the two princesses of rhyme and reason to bring order and reason back to the land of wisdom. But just as he's sending Milo and two companions off on the mission, the king says, now there's something about your mission of rescuing the princesses that's, uh, that's very important, but I can't tell you what it is until you return. So Milo is puzzled by this, but off he goes, and they have many adventures, and they go to Digitopolis, and he has to get the mathematician to agree to this mission. And of course, the two brothers never agree about anything, so Milo has to play a logical trick on the mathematician to get the mathematician to recognize that he and his brother, although they agree about nothing, they do in fact agree always to disagree, which is a form of, disagree uh, is a form of agreement. And having tricked the mathematician in this way, Milo gets the mathematician to agree to the mission to rescue the princesses of rhyme and reason. And as the mathematician is sending Milo out, he says, you know, there's something about this mission I have to tell you, but I, I can't tell you what it is until you return. So off he goes, and they have more adventures, and they fend off a bunch of demons. They do, in fact, rescue the princesses. Rhyme and reason is returned to the land of wisdom. Numbers and words are no longer at war with each other. And in the celebration that follows, finally, the king is as, and the mathematician are together. And so Milo finally says, so what was it about this mission that you couldn't tell me until I got back? And the two brothers look at each other, and they look at Milo, and they say, it was impossible. The mission was impossible. And Milo's, <laughs> his, he, his face falls and he spends the next day pondering that. So why do I share that story with you? A lot of people have done a lot of cool stuff in this room. It's a really cool community. My life has been blessed, blessed by all of you. I did not do this. This is not Bill Cronin. That we're celebrating here. It's us that we're celebrating here. And there's many things we did together that were impossible. They couldn't be done. 
but we didn't know they couldn't be done. So we figured out a way to do them. And that's the way the world works. So with all my heart, with blessings to all of you, thanks to all of you, thank you for having been part of this journey with me. And I'm so grateful to all of you. You. Bill, thank you so much for that gift. I hope you'll all uh, continue to uh, uh, visit with one another, uh, share warmth and community in the reception that, that follows. And for those who have uh, registered for the dinner, again, we'll be seated at 6.15. Thanks again for coming this afternoon. <laughs>